Hammer did not obey the blood ancestor command, and tragedy struck in the next second. Because Palmer caused the Blood Ancestor to lose the Oxido Lumen, the Blood Ancestor killed Marchand as a punishment. On the other side, Vasily and the others successfully escaped from the Blood Horde, just as they were preparing to go home. Unexpectedly, Gus chased after them, both sides immediately raised their guns, and Gus urged them to fulfill their agreement and hand over the Oxido Lumen to the Blood Ancestor. Abraham stated that he would not surrender the book, once the Blood Ancestor obtained it they would surely destroy it. At that moment, Quinlan and Angel also arrived, making the situation even more unfavorable for the two. Abraham proposed a suggestion to use the Oxido Lumen to lure the Blood Ancestor. As long as they killed the Blood Ancestor, the book would be useless to them. After considering it, Quinlan agreed to his plan, recognizing the formidable power of the extermination squad and the effectiveness of their cooperation. Later, Abraham went to Quinlan's residence. He first began deciphering the contents of the book, but Quinlan felt it was a waste of time. The blood army that the blood ancestor were building would soon take shape. Abraham listened and silenced Quinlan. This battle was crucial for humanity's future, and they had to prepare for victory. Having lost Nora, F spends his days drinking at home. One day, when Justine came to deliver materials to F, she delivered some bad news. The mortality rate from the virus last week was 100%, but it had dropped to 70% this week. F didn't know what caused this change either. Justine valued Vasily's ability to exterminate pests and appointed him to lead the Navy SEALs. After discovering the Blood's Nest, the group began their extermination plan. These SEALs are very well equipped. With heat sensors too, they could detect and kill Bloods hiding in the darkness immediately. The Navy SEALs continued to move deeper into the nest. Just as they arrived at a corridor, a group of ambushing bloods suddenly rushed towards them. Under the captain's command, everyone opened fire. The clearing mission was completed, but they still couldn't find the blood ancestor whereabouts. At night, F returned to his former home and started drinking again. Suddenly, strange noises came from outside. F immediately went to the door to check but a feeler jumped out. Then another one appeared at the door, and the two feelers surrounded F. Strangely, they didn't attack, but seemed to be waiting for something. At that moment, F sensed someone entering, and saw that it was Kelly. F immediately asked about Zack. Kelly said Zack hadn't been turned into a blood and was living with her. Then Kelly began relaying the blood ancestor words. We want the woman. Book? You kept Zack alive to trade him for a book? You have a choice to make, a lumen, or a sack. Gus plunged the needle into a major artery and then dripped his own fresh blood into a basin. Soon, the basin was filled with blood. Afterwards, Gus carried the bowl to the living room, where a blood was present. It turned out she was Gus's mother. Gus had killed many bloods, even his own brother without hesitation, but he could never bring himself to harm his mother. When Blood saw the food, she extended her meat spike directly. Blood quickly drank up the blood and then looked at Gus again, but Gus was already too weak and unable to continue drawing blood. Seeing this, his mother angrily knocked the bowl away. Gus was devastated by this, promising his mother that he would avenge her by killing Blood Ancestor. On the other side, the primogenitors called for Quinlan and questioned him about the whereabouts of the Oxido Lumen. Quinlan listened with disdain and gave the patriarchs another scolding. Later, Quinlan stated that the Oxido Lumen was indeed in his possession and he wouldn't hand it over. He planned to use the book to lure out the Blood Ancestor. When the patriarchs learned that Abraham was deciphering the Oxido Lumen, they became furious and warned and threatened Quinlan. Quinlan replied, stating that they were only allies. After speaking, Quinlan left the place directly. At night, Vasily led the Navy SEAL team in continuing the extermination plan. Through a thermal reactor, Vasily discovered a large gathering of bloods beneath their feet. The more there were, the higher the chance of the blood ancestor being present. Subsequently, the Navy SEAL team arrived at an underground tunnel. They quickly encountered two bloods, which Vasily referred to as vampire sentinels. They aimed to kill them with a single strike, as otherwise they would alert nearby bloods. After dealing with the sentinels, the team continued to advance inside. At that moment, the captain suddenly spotted a person, which made Vasily feel uneasy. 
He quickly brought up the playback and discovered that the person was Eichhorst. Vasily saw this and immediately gave the seals a capture mission, explaining that the man was one of Blood Ancestor's men. Upon hearing this, the Navy SEAL team immediately pursued and followed until they reached a church. Vasily was concerned that they might not be a match for Eichhorst, so he also drove to the scene. By this time, the soldiers had already entered the interior of the church. The captain signaled for them to split into two teams to search the church. Shortly after they separated, their night vision goggles began to malfunction frequently. The next second, a piercing sound erupted, causing the soldiers intense headaches. Meanwhile, Vasily saw the video feeds being interrupted one by one. He immediately contacted the captain and urged them to retreat quickly. Subsequently, Vasily grabbed his rifle from the trunk and rushed into the church. While the Navy SEAL team was retreating, a dark figure suddenly flashed by. As the captain went to investigate, screams were heard from behind. When the captain returned, he found that the team members had been torn in half. At that moment, Vasily arrived. The captain instructed Vasily to quickly rescue their team members while he prepared to confront the monster with the thermal sensor. As he fired at the position of the shadow, suddenly a figure appeared behind him. It was the blood ancestor himself. On the other side, Vasily successfully found the injured team members. After examining them, it was determined that they were not infected. Vasily helped them out, but as soon as they came out, they encountered Eichhorst. Lovely evening! In a secret laboratory that Palmer invested in, they captured a group of vampires for research, aiming to uncover the secret of their immortality. The staff extracted a vaccine from the nematode worm inside the vampires' bodies. Immediately, they began human experiments. They brought in an elderly person who was on the verge of death and injected the developed vaccine into her body. Suddenly, the old person's blood pressure skyrocketed, and she started convulsing violently. Seeing the alarming situation, the experimenters immediately started resuscitating the elderly person. However, she couldn't withstand the virus in the vaccine, foaming at the mouth and her eyes turning red. Seeing that the elderly person was about to mutate into a vampire, the experimenters had no choice but to shoot her. Later, the doctor reported the experimental results to Palmer, who was infuriated upon hearing them. He had invested a huge amount of money and received no good news so far. The doctor explained that the white blood in the vampires was lethal poison. There's no way to extract a vaccine for immortality. Faced with such inhumane experiments, the doctor offered Palmer his resignation. Palmer had gone to such great lengths because since the last time he caused the blood ancestor to lose the oxidolumen, he hadn't obtained any white blood from the blood ancestor, which resulted in Palmer's deteriorating health. He was in urgent need of white blood to prolong his life. Eichhorst stated that only when they retrieve the oxidolumen can they offset the previous betrayal. F arrived at Quinlan's residence and bumped into him in the corridor. Luckily, Vasily arrived in time and saved F's life. F was a bit stunned seeing Quinlan, who resembled the blood ancestor. Subsequently, Vasily led F inside the house. Upon meeting Abraham, F recounted the events of the past few days. They both fell into sadness upon learning about Nora's death. Later, F sat outside drinking alone, and Quinlan approached him, because he sensed that something was wrong with F. A long time, Doctor. I saw Emperor Domitian slain by his own court. I witnessed Giuliano Medici's murder during Easter services and watched the Borgias strangle their own. Over the centuries, I've developed a keen nose for treachery, so I must wonder. What's the real reason you're here? F didn't offer much explanation in response to Quinlan's doubts. On the other hand, Dutch and her friends arrived at a building. Since she broke up with Vasily, she had been with them. They were running out of supplies, so they decided to take a risk and search for resources. Soon, they arrived at a wealthy household. After surveying the area and finding no one, they immediately started searching for supplies. Then, cautiously, they entered the bedroom to find useful tools. However, as the man checked under the bed, the woman noticed something unusual and walked over, unaware that a blood had silently approached from behind. Hearing the screams, Dutch and the others immediately ran to the bedroom. Dutch shot and killed one blood, 
then shot another one. Following that, Dutch stood on the bed and started shooting under it. Just then, another blood emerged from behind the two. The man blocked the attack with his hand before retaliating and escaping the house. Dutch turned around and killed the blood under the bed, but when she prepared to deal with the other one, she realized her gun was out of bullets. At this moment, the man who had escaped the room immediately called their companions to flee, paying no heed to Dutch's well-being. Soon, Dutch returned to the meeting point with her companions. She decided to part ways with these heartless friends. Just then, Dutch noticed that something was off with her companion. She used a UV light on him and discovered hundreds of wriggling nematode worm on his body. Initially, Dutch didn't want to deal with him, but one sentence from the man completely enraged her. Zack was imprisoned in a secret room and witnessed a horrifying scene while fumbling. Zack was immediately frightened and ran away. Although Kelly retained her human form, she still needed to regularly feed on fresh blood. Soon, Zack reached a dead end. Kelly chased after him at that moment. Due to the intense movement, Zack's asthma flared up again, his breathing became extremely rapid, and he asked his mother to get his medicine for him. Kelly didn't respond to his request but instead knelt in front of Zack, because she hadn't fed enough. Kelly uncontrollably extended her flesh stinger once again, however, Kelly suddenly stopped. It turned out that the blood ancestor managed to regain control over Kelly's body in time. This saved Zack's life. The blood ancestor slowly approached Zack and once again controlled Kelly to forcefully open Zack's mouth. Blood ancestor then fed white blood to Zack. In the next moment, Zack's asthma was completely cured. Vasily suddenly approached and conveyed that the owner of the Oxido Lumen wanted to meet him. Abraham, upon hearing this, decided to make a trip. As he had possessed the Oxido Lumen for 40 years and might know the contents of the book. After Abraham left, F prepared to steal the Oxido Lumen. He searched Abraham's room but found no trace of the book. Later, F discovered a strange room. When he pulled back the curtains, he found a cabinet illuminated by several ultraviolet lights. These ultraviolet lights were there to prevent the blood ancestor from stealing it. Just as F was about to open the cabinet, Quinlan suddenly appeared behind him. Clearly, both of them had similar intentions, so, they temporarily formed a partnership. Abraham and F arrived at the agreed location, only to find that Palmer was the person who came. Vasily immediately drew his gun upon seeing Palmer. Upon realizing that Palmer had no ill intentions, Abraham asked Vasily to put the gun down. He wanted to hear what Palmer wanted from them. Palmer came to propose a trade. He could withdraw all support for the blood ancestor. But Abraham had to give him the secret of longevity, because Abraham was over 10 years older than him, yet still full of vitality, so the only thing he could think of was to extract white blood to renew his life. Abraham, without concealing anything, admitted that he knew the method of extracting white blood. However, Abraham didn't believe Palmer at all. He stated that with the Oxido Lumen and white blood in his hands, he was certain they would defeat the blood ancestor. After saying that, he left immediately. Vasily and F returned to Quinlan's residence. At that moment, Abraham discovered that the Oxido Lumen was missing. They speculated that Quinlan took it to lure the blood ancestor. Fortunately, Vasily had installed a tracker on the book in advance to prevent anyone from stealing it. In the market where human trafficking took place during the ancient Roman era, it wasn't ordinary people being sold, but rather some deformed monsters. Quinlan was also captured by the merchants and found himself encountering a woman who would change his life. The merchant then begins to show Ankaria how Quinlan eats. They drove a goat into an iron cage, and Quinlan extended his stinger to bite the goat's neck upon seeing the food. Ankaria was excited by what she saw, stating that Quinlan was not a cursed monster a prince born of the forest of darkness. Ankaria wanted to buy Quinlan, but the boss refused to sell. The boss considered this leech to be their money-making machine. Ankaria immediately countered, saying that he was not a leech but a vampire prince. This instantly frightened the boss because vampires were considered ominous creatures at the time and could potentially be cursed. To save his own life, the boss immediately sold Quinlan to Ankaria. After Ankaria purchased Quinlan, she took him to a jungle hut. Facing the bloodthirsty Quinlan, Ankaria was not afraid. As she watched Ankaria's pulsing blood vessels, Quinlan uncontrollably extended his stinger. Fortunately, Ankaria managed to bring back Quinlan's humanity in time. Ankaria begins to tell Quinlan about Quinlan's life. There were a total of seven vampire progenitors in the world. 
and his father was the seventh-ranked blood ancestor, he was undoubtedly being pursued by his father, and Caria's purpose was to train Quinlan in order to kill the blood ancestor in the future, and so, Quinlan and Ancaria secluded themselves in the jungle for two years, until one day, when Quinlan sensed someone tracking him after returning home from an outing, Quinlan quickly took cover in a tent, and soon a group of vampires barged in, quietly, they approached the bed, preparing to attack Ancaria, Quinlan took him out just in time, trained by Ancaria, Quinlan had become incredibly formidable in combat, making these small vampires no match for him. Ankaria woke up to the sound of the fight and immediately realized that they were sent by the blood ancestor. So, Ankaria prepared to take Quinlan to a new place to live. However, Quinlan wanted to wait for the blood ancestor to come, as it would allow him to fulfill his mission, but Ankaria says Quinlan's no match for him yet. Thus, Quinlan and Ankaria continued their search for a new dwelling together. After crossing several snow-capped mountains, the two finally settled in a cave. Unexpectedly, at this moment, the blood ancestor arrived based on the intelligence. Quinlan immediately grabbed his sword upon seeing him, but the blood ancestor did not attack. Instead, he tried to persuade Quinlan to join his blood army. However, influenced by Ankaria, as a vampire prince, Quinlan vowed to fight for humanity in his lifetime. Seeing that Quinlan was stubborn, the blood ancestor broke the entrance of the cave. Soon, a large number of boulders piled up at the entrance, blocking the way out. The blood ancestor's goal was to make the hungry Quinlan drink and carry his blood to unleash his wild instincts. And so, the two were trapped for three days and three nights. Ankaria, now weak, was barely hanging on. She hoped that Quinlan could drink her blood to store strength or else he would be powerless when the blood ancestor returned, to give Quinlan the strength to fight the blood ancestor block. Ankaria cut her own neck, as she watched the blood gush out. The hungry Quinlan extended his stinger and bit into her. After an unknown amount of time, the blood ancestor returned to the cave once again. Ankaria, by now, was already a lifeless corpse, seeing that Quinlan had consumed human blood. The blood ancestor invited him to join once more, but Quinlan decisively refused the blood ancestor's invitation. Quinlan launched an attack directly, but the blood ancestor easily evaded it. Ankaria had told him that he was not yet a match for the blood ancestor. He would wait until he grew stronger before seeking revenge against the blood ancestor. Thus, Quinlan instantly left the cave. Quinlan and F, carrying the Oxido Lumen, are preparing to lure up the blood ancestor. F first goes to a supermarket and finds a blood. Everything the blood sees or hears will be known by the blood ancestor. Quinlan then approaches and controls the blood. And after finishing, F takes out the Oxido Lumen and presents a few requests to the blood ancestor. You're gonna have to come through on your end. Here are the terms. You will show up yourself. Not your Nazi butler. You. You will bring my son. You will show him to me before I give you the book. He will be unharmed. He will be human. The exchange will occur just after sundown. The location, a favorite fishing spot of Zack and mine. He knows it. Not Kelly. No one else. If you don't bring him, you'll know that he's dead or turned and you will never get the book. Blink if you understand. I'm hanging on now. Quinlan asks F to rescue Zack and leave the rest to him. Abraham and the others track the Oxido Lumen based on its location. To successfully complete the mission, Vasily brings two silver grenades. At this moment, Abraham realizes something is wrong because the bloods cannot cross the river. Yet the Oxido Lumen is located in the middle of the river. F arrives at the agreed-upon location, Brighton Beach, by boat. After landing, he anxiously waits, from dusk until evening. At this time, as promised, the blood ancestor arrives at the destination. F takes the Oxido Lumen out of his backpack. He demands that the blood ancestor only let Kelly and Zack come over. After obtaining the blood's consent, Kelly takes Zack and walks over. When they approach, he signals Kelly to stop. He wants to make sure that Zack has not been turned into a blood. Kelly takes off her mask, only to find that she is a feeler. The feeler quickly rushes towards F and knocks him down. In a dangerous moment, F uses the silver Oxido Lumen to strike the feeler's face pressing him against the wall and burning his face with the Oxido Lumen. Kelly immediately comes to help, but F blocks her stinger. Then, the two engage in a fight. The feelers attacks F again, and the Oxido Lumen accidentally falls to the ground. Kelly picks up the Oxido Lumen and runs towards the blood ancestor, while fighting the feelers. 
F pulls out his silver sword. By this time, the Blood Ancestor has already put the Oxido Lumen into his bag. At that moment, Blood Ancestor's men were suddenly fired upon, so it was Quinlan who came out of ambush. At the same time, Abraham and the others have also arrived at the beach based on the location. After getting off the car, the Silly notices a Navy SEAL team up ahead. He starts shouting, but when they turn around, Vasily realizes that they have all been turned into bloods. However, they ignored Vasily and started shooting at Quinlan. Despite Quinlan's formidable combat skills, he couldn't withstand the onslaught of bullets. Abraham immediately threw a silver grenade, completely eliminating the blood soldiers. Then, Vasily threw another grenade at the blood ancestor. Caught off guard, the blood ancestor was instantly burned by the silver grenade, causing him to struggle in pain. Seeing this, Quinlan approached with a bone sword and decapitated the Blood Ancestor. Afterwards, Quinlan, heavily injured, collapsed on the ground, and everyone immediately rushed to check on him. At that moment, a red bloodworm wriggled out of the Blood Ancestor body and started moving towards the sewer. Abraham happened to witness this, but he didn't know what it was. Upon returning, F immediately performed surgery on Quinlan. After removing the bullets from Quinlan's body, F proceeded to stitch up the wounds. Meanwhile, Vasily was happy that they had finally defeated the blood after months of confrontation. However, Abraham wore a worried expression, concerned that the blood might not be completely eradicated. After completing the surgery, F emerged from the room. Vasily questioned why F was with Quinlan, holding the Oxido Lumen, searching for the blood ancestor. F didn't hide anything and revealed the details of his deal with the Blood Ancestor. Abraham and the others were furious upon hearing this betrayal. Abraham didn't hesitate to kick F out of the team, disheartened. F left the place. However, at that moment, he was targeted by a blood. Ever since the beheading of the Blood Ancestor, the blood lost control. Fortunately, F noticed in time and successfully killed the blood. On the other side, Zack was still confined in a small dark room when sudden knocking was heard, thinking it was his mother Kelly returning, but outside the door was a hungry bloods. Upon hearing the human voice, he started violently pounding on the door. Unexpectedly, the blood managed to open the door and invade Zack's room. Kelly arrived just in time to save Zack. Meanwhile, when Quinlan regained consciousness, Abraham immediately approached him. According to the logic, Quinlan, being the blood ancestor's son, should have died along with him. However, the other blood, except for their lack of discipline, remained the same as before. Abraham believed that the blood ancestor hadn't truly died, so he wanted Quinlan to take him to the patriarchs to find the truth. Quinlan listened and took Abraham to the originals. Quinlan then took Abraham to the originals and began to tell them about his beheading of blood ancestor. The conversation revealed that blood ancestor wasn't really dead. Just without the carcass, Abraham mentioned seeing a red bloodworm and hoped the originals could provide an explanation. If you did not kill the crimson worm, you did not slay the master. What worm is this? The essence of his being. He has not yet taken another host, but when he does, he will be just as powerful as before. Quinlan was angry. Quinlan drew his sword and pointed it at the originals. The vampire warriors began to draw their guns and take aim. There were so many of them that Quinlan had no choice but to put away his bone sword. Quinlan calmed down and said goodbye to the originals. He was going to join Abraham on the Oxido Lumen to find a way to kill the blood ancestor. Gus has to draw 300 milliliters of blood every day. And he does this for his mother's sake. Taking advantage of his mother's mealtime, he quickly takes control of her. Then, he puts a helmet on her head. Drawing blood every day has made Gus very weak, so he needs to ensure his own safety. If he turns into a bloods, his mother will also not be able to survive. At that moment, there is a hurried knocking at the door. After questioning, it is revealed that Angel has arrived. In order to avoid exposing his mother, Gus can only come up with an excuse to send him away. However, just as Gus collapses heavily due to excessive blood loss, Angel senses that something is wrong and forcefully breaks into the house. Upon entering, he sees Gus lying on the floor and immediately helps him up. But when they reach the living room, the sight of the blood still startles Angel. After a short rest, Gus slowly recovers and then tells Angel about how he has been feeding his blood mother. Angel is shocked to hear this. He has never seen such a filial son. But Gus's body cannot sustain this situation for long. So Angel proposes to kill her. And Gus is reluctant to hear it. However, Gus is reluctant, stating that his mother is still his mother even if she becomes a blood. 
maybe even develop an antidote for the virus. Helpless, Angel engages in a heated argument with Gus. Angel prepares to kill Gus's mother forcefully. Seeing this, Gus stands in front of him and picks up an axe from the table. The two start grappling, driven by his desperate desire to save his mother. Gus unleashes all his strength and pins Angel against the wall, warning him not to have any intentions towards his mother again. Just then, a siren is heard from downstairs. Gus immediately goes to the window to check. The police have come to search the building, and if his mother is discovered, she will be shot on the spot. So, Gus quickly brings in a wheelchair, preparing to escape with his mother. Angel, deeply moved by Gus's filial love, decides to help him. They take the elevator to the ground floor, but the first floor is full of cops. Gus pushed his mother toward the door while the police searched the room. However, just as success seems imminent, they unexpectedly collide with a police officer who has just entered the door. Despite their desperate attempts to explain, the cloth-covered mother is just too weird. The police insisted on checking it out, so Gus had no choice but to lift the cloth. The police officer then asks them to remove their helmets. Angel comes up with a plan and cuts the rope that restrains the blood. Just at this moment, two police officers came in. Gus and the other person immediately turned their heads and ran. A couple more cops came from behind, and that's how the two were beaten up. Then they were arrested. Soon, the two of them were taken to prison, where the police did not take their fingerprints or collect their blood. Instead, the criminals were placed in a basketball court. It was during dinner that Gus finally understood the situation. It turned out that the government lacked manpower to fight against the blood, so they forcibly prisoners for combat. Soon, Gus and the other person were given their first mission. The police gave them some cold weapons and asked them to clean up a tunnel infested with blood. Gus, of course, didn't want to go, but the cops said if he didn't, he'd be shot on the spot. Unable to face the police's tyranny, Gus could only temporarily yield. The prison guard drove several criminals into a tunnel, with Gus leading the way. Soon, they arrived at a fork in the road. While discussing which way to go, a blood suddenly dropped from the sky. Gus quickly took down the bloods, but suddenly, another one jumped out. An angel killed it with a strike. He suggested that everyone should quickly escape back. Just as he finished speaking, a bloods pounced on him and stung his neck with a stinger. Gus once again dealt with the bloods, and the others started to flee. Shortly after, a group of bloods surrounded Gus and Angel, seeing the situation. The two could only retreat. Only Gus and Angel managed to escape from this clearance operation. On the other side, during an interview, Justine was asked about the forcible conscription of prisoners. Justine looked confused, clearly unaware of this matter. Shortly after, Justine went to the scene and found the police chief, but she was shocked to find out they had really done such a thing behind her back. This made Justine very angry, but after some thought, they did indeed need manpower to eliminate the bloods, so Justine reluctantly accepted this matter. Eichhorst gathered several bloods and prepared to launch a fierce counterattack against humans. These people were either police officers or Justine's assistants, making it easier for them to infiltrate the government building. Eichhorst made a police officer lie on an operating table, then used a surgical knife to cut open his abdomen. He then inserted a timed bomb into his belly. F had been drowning his sorrows at home. Suddenly, there was a knock on the door, and when he opened it, he was surprised to see Dutch. On the other side, the bloods with the bomb implanted infiltrated the government building. One is standing upstairs, while the other went to the most crowded area downstairs. Just then, Vasily noticed something unusual, but it was already too late. <laughs> Countless staff members were invaded by the worms. Thankfully, Vasily managed to take off his coat in time to avoid the disaster. Vasily helped Justine who also quickly took off her coat. However, a worm crawled out of her forehead. In just a few seconds, the worm burrowed into her eye. Fortunately, Vasily pulled out a UV light and successfully killed the worm, but this still didn't guarantee that everything would be fine. F and Dutch quickly received the message and rushed over. Then, F examined Justine and thankfully killed the bloodworm before they had a chance to reproduce. Justine let out a sigh of relief upon hearing this. The attack was highly organized, and they weren't the only targets. Staten Island and several safe zones were also attacked by bomb-carrying bloods. The death toll had already exceeded 100. After finishing their tasks, F and Dutch prepared to go home. But just as they got in the car, a blood suddenly appeared at the door. F used a stun gun to knock it down to the ground. As F pulled out his gun, the blood started speaking. Good weather. You failed. You want to ask me about 
you suck the murder, but you're afraid of the answer. Where is he? He is with me. Always with me. Is he turned? Answer me. Answer me! Kelly was preparing to give her son a pat, but as soon as Zack saw the pat, he got scared, it's blood's bred feelers that are several times more powerful than normal bloods. Zack had witnessed feelers killing people, so he quickly refused his mother's kind offer. Kelly told Zack not to worry, from now on, it will be your loyal servant, and she asked Zack to give it a command. Zack, who had been bored being confined underground all day, accepted the pat that Kelly gave him. On the other side, F and Dutch were playing chess in the darkness, they were doing this to attract the attention of the bloods. Soon, there was movement from the bushes behind Dutch. Two bloods quickly emerged on F's side as well. Then, Dutch shot and killed one with a gun, and F killed another with a silver sword. One bloods remained and attacked the two of them. F used a stun baton to knock it down, and they captured alive bloods. They did this for research purposes. Soon, they brought the small bloods back to the laboratory, and F immediately dissected it. F found that even if only the brain and spinal cord remained, they would still react. He placed fresh blood near its mouth, and the stinger suddenly showed a desire to feed in the next second. From this, it could be concluded that they were controlled by parasites. All other organs had completely decayed. If a normal person's body deteriorated to this degree, it would be difficult for the heart to keep beating. F cut open the brain of the bloods to explain to Dutch, this mass of worms is what controls the body and also has communication abilities. That's why the blood ancestor can know anything through other bloods. At this moment, Dutch was ready to eat something, but when Dutch opened the microwave, the mass of nematodes began to wriggle violently. F was extremely surprised to see this, and then signaled Dutch to turn off the microwave for a moment. After Dutch closed it, the nematodes of worms returned to normal. Through repeated experiments, F discovered that microwaves can interfere with the nematode signals. On the other side, Vasily was trying to locate the nest of the bloods again. He found a bloods eating by the roadside. Then Vasily walked down with a signal device. When the bloods noticed, Vasily rushed forward and placed a signal tag on its neck. Just then, another bloods emerged from the side and attacked Vasily. But Vasily managed to knock it down. Immediately after, he placed a signal tag on the neck of this bloods as well. By this time, Vasily had already gotten back into his car, leaving the two bloods helpless and roaring. On the other side, Dutch built a microwave sensor. Meanwhile, F captured a bloods and locked it in a cage. He first placed a basin of fresh blood on the ground and then stuffed an iron rod and a key into the iron cage. They wanted to test the intelligence of the bloods. F untied the bloods and it directly picked up the key next to it upon seeing the fresh blood. This left F and Dutch dumbfounded. As the bloods was about to open the iron door, Dutch immediately activated the microwave sensor. In the next second, the bloods became expressionless. Just as F and Dutch were celebrating their victory, the bloods suddenly picked up the key that had fallen to the ground and attempted to open the door again. This caught F and Dutch off guard. In no time, the bloods actually managed to open the door. <laughs> With such a well-behaved probe, Zack is slowly accepting it and inviting it into his bed to play. On the other side, a group of bloods emerged from underground in the safe zone last night and attacked civilians. Justine was puzzled by this, as she had dispatched a large number of police forces to clear out the bloods in the underground tunnels. To find out the reason, Justine sent Vasily out. He installed trackers on several bloods and his mission was to locate the blood's nest. Following the signals, Vasily arrived at a record store and indeed found traces inside. The deep and seemingly endless tunnel was dug by the bloods. Vasily went in without hesitation. The narrow passage was barely passable for an adult. But fortunately, Vasily quickly emerged from the hole. Outside, Vasily discovered that it was an unfinished tunnel. Vasily proceeded deeper into the tunnel. Eventually, he encountered two workers ahead who turned out to be bloods. They immediately engaged in a fight upon meeting. Just as Vasily shot one of them with a handgun, the other one took the opportunity to attack and knock Vasily down. Luckily, Vasily managed to grab his gun in time and successfully killed the bloods. Afterward, Vasily reached a very deep underground tunnel. He secured the safety rope and slid down. After passing through a corridor, Vasily found the blood's nest. Despite being mentally prepared, 
The scene in front of Vasily still frightened him. There are tens of thousands of bloods lying in the huge pit underfoot. Vasily quickly left the area. Using the tunnel layout map, Vasily soon returned to the surface. Upon coming out, Vasily realized that he was in the city's central park. He quickly reported the situation to Justine. Justine was shocked to hear this. After discussions among the group, they decided to carry out a clearance plan for the Central Park the next day at noon. Abraham was translating the Oxido Lumen with Quinlan's assistance. The content of the Oxido Lumen was quickly deciphered. However, the book did not specifically mention how to kill the blood ancestor. Abraham felt that the book was hiding something. It was not until he saw an illustration of the sun that Abraham seemed to understand something. After closing the book, he prepared to take Quinlan to a certain place. They arrived at the rooftop and Abraham exposed that page to the sunlight. Under the sun's rays, a pile of text appeared. The author's purpose was to prevent the bloods from knowing, as they could never be exposed to sunlight. Abraham began deciphering the content of the book. To hide the text so the Strigoi could never read it. After being surrounded by an army of thousands, the living plague was contained within a stone sarcophagus lined with an alloy of silver and lead tomb for the creature and for the crimson worm within it, trapped for all eternity. A box. A box. Justine immediately arranged for a SEAL team to cooperate with him to carry out the clearing plan. They started the operation as soon as it was daylight. Soon, Vasily met with the SEAL team leader, Rogers. Afterward, he took Rogers back to the base to get the silver powder. Meanwhile, Dutch and F were conducting experiments at the base. When F learned that the government planned to clean up the bloods on a large scale, he also wanted to go to the scene. This would allow for better research. On the other side, Abraham and Quinlan started to worry again. They had found a way to completely eliminate the bloods, but they were having trouble finding out where the bloods were hiding. Abraham decided to pay a visit to Palmer. Soon, the two met under a sky bridge. Palmer's organs were slowly failing, so he could only walk with the help of a wheelchair. Abraham said he could provide a method to extract the bloodworm but needed Palmer to reveal the current location of the blood ancestor. In order to prolong his life, Palmer agreed to his request without hesitation. Soon, morning came, and Gus was assigned another task to clean up the bloods. The prison guards said that if they could complete this mission, everyone would be pardoned. Upon hearing this, everyone stepped forward to select weapons. When they were done, they were herded back into the tunnel. On the other hand, Vasily and the SEAL team also began their operation. They were attacked by the Bloods midway, and everyone could only respond in a hurry. In the chaos, one team member was bitten on the neck. Another team member was dragged away by the Bloods. After Vasily shot and killed the Bloods, the two quickly ran to save their captured teammate. But on the way, another Bloods appeared. Fortunately, Vasily shot in time and saved Roger's life. Then, the two found their teammate ahead. After being exposed to ultraviolet light, he had been invaded by the bloodworm. Regrettably, Rogers had to end his teammate's life. On the other side, the police brought Gus and the others to the tunnel that needed to be cleaned. The police ordered them to enter the tunnel to clean up the bloods. Gus volunteered after hearing this. The police then asked Gus and another person to take the lead. After entering the tunnel, they soon encountered a blood's head on. The police outside heard the commotion and immediately shouted towards Gus and the other person. In a short while, Gus's voice came, indicating that the tunnel had been cleared. The police immediately let the remaining criminals enter the tunnel. Everyone entered the tunnel and was shocked to see a pile of blood's corpses on the ground. Then, they continued walking deeper and saw a hole dug by a blood's ahead. The police immediately ordered the woman to crawl into the hole. Disobeying the order would result in being shot on the spot. Seeing that the woman was about to crawl into the cave, Gus and Angel quickly took action and subdued the police. Gus stated that they only wanted to safely leave. However, the police opened fire directly, and Angel immediately returned fire. In this way, two police officers were killed on the spot. Killing police officers is a serious crime, so everyone quickly prepared to escape from here. Zack has been trapped in the room for a month. At this time Zack is trying to get along with the feelers. At this time, feelers noticed someone coming and opened the door and found it was Kelly. It turns out that she learned about the humans planning to eliminate the vampires. So she is ready to take Zack and escape from here. Upon hearing this, Zack starts packing his luggage. Before leaving, he writes a message to his father in a book. On the other side, 
Gus leads a group of criminals in search of an exit. Suddenly, one of them is dragged into the sewer, causing panic among the others. Just then, they hear movement from above, and everyone starts shooting their guns upwards. After killing a vampire, the surroundings quiet down. Not long after, another vampire jumps out and drags a man away. At this time, there were roars from all around, and Gus had no choice but to give up the pursuit in order to take care of the overall situation. Unfortunately, they quickly run out of bullets. At this time, another vampire appeared from the side, but it was killed immediately. Nobody knows who fired the shot. But when Gus looks closely, he realizes it was Vasily. After not seeing each other for days, the two greet each other amicably. During their conversation, Vasily learns that Gus was forcefully conscripted, which surprises him. Vasily expresses his sincere apologies for the situation. However, they still need manpower for the elimination plan. So Vasily hopes Gus can help them, out of camaraderie from fighting side by side in the past. Gus readily agrees, but they need to safely escort the woman out. So, Gus assigns this task to Angel. With Gus joining them, the mission to eliminate the vampires becomes much easier. On the other side, Justine is waiting anxiously in the control room. As it will soon be dark, the vampire army will awaken and start searching for food. The director told Justine that it was useless to worry now. They could only place all their hopes on Vasily. Meanwhile, Vasily and his group are getting closer to the vampire nest. Suddenly, Vasily notices a book dropped on the ground, and upon opening it, he realizes it was left behind by Zack. Vasily still needs to carry out the elimination plan, so he immediately contacts F via radio. F gets excited upon hearing the news and immediately enters the tunnel with Dutch. However, they are attacked by the vampires just a few steps in. F shoots down the vampire stinger, causing it great pain, but in the next moment, their location is exposed through this wounded vampire. Guess what? They know we're here now. On the other side, Vasily and his group have reached above the vampire nest. While Vasily is installing silver powder bombs, several feelers surround them. Gus and the others can only provide cover, but the number of feelers keeps increasing, just as they can no longer hold on. They're coming from everywhere, Finn! Forget the wire, just pull the pins and toss them! No! I gotta make sure that the silver spreads throughout the counter. It's gotta go off at the right height. Or else we're not gonna get all of them. Hurry up, Pat, let's go! Vasily successfully finishes the installation and throws the explosives filled with silver powder. Fire in the hole! Save me alive! Meanwhile, F and Dutch arrive at the place where Zack is being held. They become even more worried after seeing the letter left by Zack. Dutch concludes that he couldn't have gone far, so they start searching around. Just as she leaves, Eichhorst finds F. Where's my son? He's a very special young man. So much potential. He's safe. From you. He told us how you abandoned him. So many times. Your wife and your child to call me to you. Just as Eichhorst is about to release his stinger, Dutch arrives in time and cuts off his hand with a knife. Eichhorst quickly escapes and disappears in an instant. On the other side, Justine learns that Vasily and his group have completed the mission. She becomes extremely happy, but soon another piece of bad news arrives. The vampires take advantage of their large-scale operation and attack other vulnerable safe zones, and the vampires in that pit are just a small part of it. Eichhorst roasts his severed arm in the fireplace and then he puts it in water to cool it down. Vasily informs Citrakian about the major battle from last night. Citrakian doesn't feel disappointed upon hearing it. Instead, he says that everything is within his expectations. As long as the master is there, the vampire army will never be wiped out. Therefore, Citrakian came out today to build a coffin that concealed the master. The two came to a silverware store, but it had been looted. So the two came to the basement. Sure enough, they discover a vault. Vasily takes out several detonators and sticks them on the vault door. Then they quickly run outside. After the explosion, they promptly return to the basement. The heavy door has been blown open, revealing a pile of silverware that catches their eyes. These silverware pieces are enough to create a silver coffin. Upon their return, Citrakian melts all the silverware and pours it into the mold. Letting it slowly cool down, he intends to personally craft a coffin for the master. On the other side, 
Quinlan arrives at the base to inquire about any new discoveries from F. F first shows Quinlan the vampire communication device. Then, Dutch presents the sound wave recordings from yesterday. Initially, the sound remained stable within a specific area, but suddenly the signal spiked. This should be the master issuing combat instructions to the vampires. If they can pinpoint this sound, they can easily trace the master's whereabouts. However, the audio signal is somewhat chaotic, and they need to isolate the master's voice from it. But they need another audio reference to proceed. Just as everyone is at a loss, F suddenly remembers the black box from the plane crash, which surely contains the master's audio signal. There is no time to waste, so they immediately head to the airport. When they reach the restricted area, they are stopped by several soldiers. Due to Quinlan's special identity, he cannot expose himself to the soldiers. F quickly presents his identification card. Fortunately, F works for Senator Justine, which exempts them from inspection. As they exit the restricted area, they hold their guns ready at all times, because there is widespread looting of supplies happening outside. Just then, a group of bandits appears ahead, robbing other civilians. Dutch immediately jumps out of the car and rushes over. With F closely following, the bandits quickly take a hostage, resulting in an immediate standoff between the two sides. The rescued family didn't even say thank you and immediately got in the car to escape from here. Afterward, Quinlan starts licking the blood off his knife. On the other side, Palmer receives a shipping manifest with a forged signature. Palmer immediately suspects Eichhorst and rushes to the dock. When Palmer tries to board the ship to inspect the cargo, he is stopped by several crew members who inform him that Eichhorst doesn't allow anyone on the ship. Palmer becomes angry and asserts that the ship belongs to him and he has the right to know what is being transported. He prepares to force his way in, but his subordinates tell him they are unarmed. Facing a larger group, Palmer has no choice but to retreat and make another plan. This is a specialized human slaughterhouse. Eichhorst is inspecting the results with the person in charge, but he becomes angry when he sees the mannequins hanging there, stating that these things can't replace humans. The person in charge informs him that an 80-kilogram sandbag is equivalent to a normal adult. Eichhorst slowly approaches them, You see the difference now? Can a bag of sand struggle? Putting added stress on the system? No, sir, it can't. Then, Eichhorst signals for the experiment to continue. When the person in charge presses the switch, the machine starts operating. The man is transported onto a conveyor belt and stops at a designated position. In the next moment, an iron cage quickly locks him in, and needles extend from both sides piercing his neck to draw blood. The blood is slowly drawn into containers below. And in just a few seconds, all the blood is drained from the man's body. But Eichhorst is unsatisfied. He wants the person in charge to increase the speed. Startled. The person in charge can only comply with his demand. Later, Eichhorst arrives at Stoneheart Group. He learns that Palmer went to the dock and comes to confront him. Palmer was also very angry after hearing this. He said that he is running all this now. And without his funding, Eichhorst would not be able to succeed at all. Eichhorst warns Palmer to do his job well in order to receive the master's favor. After saying that, Eichhorst coolly leaves the place. Mr. Duncan, get whatever manpower you need. We're going to take that ship. Soon, Palmer gathers security personnel and returns to the dock. When they arrive, they find all the crew members on board the ship dead on the deck. Upon inspection, they discover that all these people had their necks snapped. Regarding this, Palmer doesn't care, he just wants to know what Eichhorst was transporting. When he opened the cabin, he found that there was nothing inside. It seems that the contents had already been transferred. On the other side, F and the others arrived at the airport by car, which has been abandoned for a long time. Soon they arrived at the control room of the airport. F and Dutch looked for the black box, while Quinlan stayed at the door to cover them. Luckily, they quickly found the black box, and then there was a burst of gunfire outside. When they went out, they found the bodies of the Strigoi on the ground, and Quinlan standing in the same spot. At night, Palmer invited Citrakian out. After learning that Palmer didn't find any clues, Citrakian turned to leave. Palmer immediately said that he found something else special. Citrakian, upon hearing this, decided to give him a few more minutes. Palmer said a ship in his name transported something from Egypt to New York. Although he didn't know what was inside, 
it was obviously of great significance to the blood ancestor. Palmer also mentioned that he no longer had the energy to continue investigating this matter. Citrakian understood that Palmer wanted the white blood to prolong his life and continue the investigation, so he took out the refined white blood and said that if there were any results, he must contact him immediately. Then he began to teach Palmer how to use the white One drop in each eye. But not here. I warn you, take it somewhere where you can rest afterwards. The serum's initial effect is traumatic. Blood. After returning, Palmer handed the medicine to the nurse and told her how to use it. After hearing the instructions, the nurse took the white blood and dropped it into Palmer's eyes according to the steps. But Palmer didn't feel any changes in his body and thought Citrakian had tricked him, but the next second, Palmer fell to the floor in pain, and the nurse immediately came forward to check the situation. She turned Palmer over and found his eyes were oozing terrifying blood, so the nurse immediately began to rescue Palmer. The next second, Palmer suddenly opened his eyes, and the effects of the white blood began to take effect. At that moment, he seemed to be filled with power. The next day, Palmer made an appointment with Citrakian. He found the address information of the captain of the ship and prepared identification documents for the two of them. Then Citrakian asked Palmer to continue investigating other leads while they hurried to find the captain. With Palmer's support, it will be easier to fight against the blood ancestors. Before that, Citrakian went to find Quinlan, because he read about an ancestral vampire sealed in Egypt in the Oxida Lumen, and that ship is likely to transport the sealed ancestral vampire. Therefore, Citrakian hopes Quinlan will go and ask the three ancestors if the ancient ancestors have joined the blood ancestor war. Quinlan was reluctant to do so, but Citrakian asked him to put aside his pride because this battle concerns the survival of the world. Quinlan eventually agreed to Citrakian's request. On the other side, F retrieved the black box and started extracting the audio. At first, the pilot was still in communication with the control panel, but the next second, the voice suddenly stopped. F concluded that the blood ancestors interfered with the plane's signal, and suddenly a powerful sound wave came from the recording. The surrounding objects began to vibrate violently. F tried to close the recording, but he wasn't very familiar with the audio extractor. In a hurry, F simply turned off the power. Then F immediately checked on Dutch's condition. Dutch had only temporarily fainted and was not seriously injured. It seems that this is the ability of the blood vampires to instantly make people lose consciousness. What's even more terrifying is that the audio just now was only a truncated version. Immediately after that, Dutch felt very uncomfortable and began to vomit. There was no choice but for the two of them to rest first before conducting the experiment. On the other side, because Angel's old injury recurred, Gus took him to the hospital. It looked safe here. So Gus prepared to go back home to find his mother. After hearing this, Angel told Gus not to worry and to gather at home after he finished treatment. Soon, Gus arrived at the old house, which was still as chaotic as it was when he left last time. He called out for his mother but received no response. Then Gus started tidying up the room. He wanted to wait for his mother to come home here. After who knows how long, Angel finished treatment and returned to Gus's home. By then, the house had been cleaned up but Gus was nowhere to be seen. Seeing this, Angel lay down on the couch and waited for Gus to come back. Angel woke up to find a vampire standing in front of him. Angel was about to take out his gun, but accidentally dropped it on the ground. Just then, Gus returned home in time. In order to protect Angel, Gus had no choice but to shoot his own mother. When Gus was a child, his father was often violent at home, and his mother was often beaten severely by his father in order to protect him. Since then, Gus vowed to protect his mother when he grew up, but now he has killed her himself. Gus slowly sat down on the sofa, and tears began to fall uncontrollably, but Gus soon regained his composure because he hadn't killed the blood ancestor yet. On the other side, Abraham and Vasily arrived at the factory owned by Stoneheart Group. They successfully entered using the employee ID cards given by Palmer. Then the two found the captain at the given address and confirmed his identity. Vasily pinned him against the wall. Then he began to ask the captain what was inside the ship, but the captain didn't say anything. So Vasily directly pulled out his gun and prepared to kill him. After seeing the gun, the captain told them that he only knew it was a large wooden crate and actively offered to take them to the place where the crate was stored. Soon the captain took Vasily and the two to a factory. This was the human slaughterhouse built by Eichhorst. Abraham immediately understood what was used for and angrily slapped the captain. The captain said he was forced to do it. If he doesn't do this he will be drained of his blood. As said by countless facilitators of genocide throughout time. Do not speak again. 
if you wish to remain alive. The captain seemed to be somewhat shaken after hearing this, so he led the two to the unloading area. As soon as they arrived, they saw workers loading wooden crates. Abraham immediately shot at them, and the captain accidentally got hit and died on the spot. Then a gunfight broke out between the two sides, and Eichhorst immediately ordered his men to drive away. When they arrived, Eichhorst took the wooden crates and left quickly. It's not that Eichhorst doesn't dare to confront Abraham, but this cargo is too important to be delayed even a little bit. On the other side, Dutch got drunk again. She and F sat on the sofa and chatted. The atmosphere gradually became ambiguous. And then they hugged each other and started kissing passionately. On the other side, Quinlan found the three ancestors. When Quinlan appeared, the ancestors asked him if he didn't say he wouldn't come again. I have a question. Perhaps a warning. We are listening. A few days ago, the master arranged for a piece of cargo from Egypt to arrive here in New York by a ship. And the Lumen recounts an incident some 3,000 years ago in which an army of Egyptians managed to seal one of your kind in a sarcophagus. Is it possible that the cargo that the master has brought here is that very same ancient? The ancients started to discuss after hearing this and confirmed that this was indeed the case. Quinlan then began to analyze. If the blood ancestor cooperates with the ancestors of the old era, then their three ancestors may not be alive for long, and they will launch an attack soon. Therefore, Quinlan suggested that the three ancestors cooperate with Abraham because he knew how to defeat the blood ancestor, but the ancients didn't believe in humans. But just then, a group of vampires surrounded them. The ancestors were very angry, thinking that Quinlan brought them here. Then the blood ancestor took control of Eichhorst's body and began to send messages. He was originally going to get rid of the three ancestors, but he didn't expect that Quinlan was also there. Blood ancestor said that the three of them could have taken over the world, but now they have become a corrupt race. Eichhorst activated the bomb in his suitcase, and the century war began. Quinlan drew his bone sword and charged, finding it easy to deal with these small vampires. The other vampire warriors also started fighting. After placing the bomb on the ground, Eichhorst left the area. Quinlan, with his centuries of training, easily defeated the vampire warriors who were much weaker. The vampire warriors were soon overwhelmed by the enemy's large numbers and were beaten down. The three ancients started to take action after witnessing this. At this moment, Eichhorst emerged from the other end of the passage, ready to detonate the bomb. Quinlan seemed to realize the danger and started moving towards the exit. In no time, a bloody path was carved out. Seeing that Eichhorst was about to detonate the bomb, Quinlan immediately pulled out his gun and eliminated the remaining bloods. After finishing everything, Quinlan immediately ran towards the exit. Just as Quinlan escaped, Eichhorst pressed the button in his hand. And so, the three ancients were forever buried underground. On the other side, Abraham and Palmer met. Abraham hoped that Palmer would use his power to search for the whereabouts of the wooden box. In order to bring down Blood Ancestor, Palmer said he would leave it to him. The Bloods had already begun to occupy the human safe zone bit by bit, and it wouldn't be long before the city completely fell. Justine still hoped that everyone would hold their ground. At this time, a police officer stepped forward, stating that they were running low on ammunition, this was clearly an unwinnable war. Justine responded by saying that as long as they concentrated all the police forces, they could definitely hold on until F developed something to counter the Bloods, but the previous failures had already crushed everyone's morale. As a result, they all resigned and dispersed. Everyone decided to escape from this doomed city. Ever since the three ancestors were buried alive by nuclear bombs, humanity's safe zone has begun to fall. The police all started to evacuate, and this scene happened to be seen by Gus and the two of them. After discussing, Gus and his companion decided to leave the city first. On the other side, F was taking a shower when he noticed something slowly approaching. <laughs> Just then, there was a knocking sound at the door. When F saw that it was Vasily, he opened the door. At that moment, Dutch had just finished washing her hair and walked out. After that, Vasily began to say that the city could no longer be defended, and all government personnel had evacuated. He hoped that F and Dutch would follow him to escape the city. Upon hearing this, F expressed that their research was about to be completed. Retreating at this time would be a waste of their efforts. 
Seeing that F was unwilling to leave, Vasily tried to persuade Dutch, but Dutch was now F's person, and she also didn't want to leave. Using the unfinished research as an excuse, seeing that they couldn't convince the two, Vasily left disappointedly, in order to complete their research as soon as possible. F and Dutch went to the underground tunnel, they wanted to capture a feeler for research. They hadn't gone far when they were targeted by a feeler, the feeler was fast, and F couldn't aim at it at all. Suddenly, Dutch was accidentally knocked down, and F rushed forward to fight the feeler. The painful feeler immediately distanced itself from the two, and Dutch took the opportunity to throw a net at it. Upon returning, F immediately dissected the feeler. Its sensory system was very powerful, and they could use it to develop a new type of microwave sensor. At this time, only Justine and a few police officers were left in the entire Hongo district. At this time, the director said that he had made contact with the defense zone in Manhattan, and there were still manpower and supplies there. After careful consideration, Justine ultimately decided to abandon the city. So, Justine prepared to leave the city with the remaining five police officers. Soon, they arrived at the entrance of a bridge, but there were long queues of cars ahead, making it impossible for vehicles to pass through. Justine sent two officers to investigate. As everyone anxiously waited, suddenly there was a knocking sound on the door. One team member approached and opened the small window, seeing their teammates, and then opened the door. At the same time, Gus and another person arrived at the bridge by car, and coincidentally witnessed the police officers being surrounded by the Bloods. Gus, filled with hatred towards the police, decided to take a detour, however, Angel wanted to rescue them, leading to a heated argument between the two. In the end, Gus agreed to go and rescue them. Meanwhile, Justine and the others were sitting in the car, unsure of what to do. Suddenly, gunshots rang out outside, and within seconds, there was silence. Shortly after, there was a knocking sound on the door, and Gus urged them to quickly come out and escape. With no other options, Justine and the others had to trust Gus. They then began to walk towards the bridge. However, as they passed by a school bus, a female officer accidentally bumped into a backpack, causing it to make noise. A large group of bloods quickly swarmed from all directions, forcing them to fight and retreat. They hurriedly ran towards the car. Justine and several officers found a car to use as cover against the attacking bloods. Gus and Angel went to a higher position, knowing that they would be safe once they passed the iron railing ahead. But just then, a bloods quietly crawled out from under the car. Seizing the opportunity, it bit Angel's leg. And upon seeing this, Gus immediately pulled out his stinger and shot at the bloods. However, it was too late. Angel had already been infected. Gus blamed himself deeply, but Angel urged Gus to leave and promised to cover for him. Gus refused, resulting in an argument between the two. Realizing that time was running out, Angel directly threw Gus down before it was too late. At this moment, the situation was dire for Justine's team as one officer was bitten on the neck. Seeing this, Justine immediately turned around and fired her gun. But unfortunately, a nematode's accidentally splashed onto her face. Soon after, it crawled into Justine's eye. However, in the final moment, she continued to fiercely fight against the Bloods while holding her gun. Angel also faced a massive onslaught from the Bloods, and he arm was bitten as well. Seeing that Gus had gone away, Angel broke the car's fuel tank. The leaked gasoline slowly flowed towards the flames. At this point, everyone prepared themselves for what seemed like their last stand. Even though they were covered in injuries, they were determined to fight the Bloods until the end. Gus had successfully reached the safe zone, bringing relief to Angel upon seeing this. In this way, Justine and Angel met their demise in the Sea of Fire. On the other side, Palmer obtained the unloading address for the wooden crate and immediately went there with security personnel. However, as soon as they entered the warehouse, they were attacked by a group of people. Palmer's trained security personnel immediately engaged in combat. Soon, they broke into the factory, and within a minute, the enemies were completely eliminated. Then, Palmer entered the factory and forcibly opened the transported wooden crate. When opened, there is a suitcase inside. Under the threat of a pistol, the person in charge could only open the box. To their surprise, it contained a makeshift nuclear bomb. The case also had an empty spot for a suitcase inside. 
He said there was an explosion in Manhattan yesterday and it must have been done by Eichhorst. The remaining nuclear bomb must be of great importance to the blood ancestor. So Palmer took it away directly. On the other side, F and Dutch had built a new type of microwave sensor to test its effectiveness. They carried the device to a nearby blood's lair. Just then, several bloods sensed their presence and approached. F quickly drew his gun to prevent any danger. Then, Dutch activated the device. As expected, these bloods were immobilized and remained motionless. F fired his gun, and the other bloods didn't react at all. It seems that the microwave sensor has been successfully developed. F slowly approached a vampire and placed a silver sword on its face. The vampire burned by the silver sword showed no reaction, and F then cut off its head with a single strike. Their microwave sensor actually proved effective against the vampires. They subsequently found Satrakian and shared this good news with him. Vasily thought it was worth a try after hearing it, but F couldn't join the mission. F disagreed. Despite his past betrayal, as it was for the sake of his son, Dutch also defended F upon seeing the situation, but Vasily blamed F for the city's downfall. The two of them immediately engaged in a heated argument. How about that assault on Central Park? How'd that work out? Half the cops in New York are dead because of you. You're responsible for those people. Hey, 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 stop it! As a doctor, F was no match for Vasily. However, F's long suppressed emotions made him furious. So he stood up and fought with Vasily again. Satrakian quickly stopped the two of them. He said that the blood ancestor wanted to disintegrate them from within. So he hoped that the two would put aside their personal grudges for the time being and fight against the blood ancestor together. At that moment, Quinlan, who had been missing for two days, appeared. Satrakian began to ask him what the ancestors had said. After hearing this, Quinlan told everyone about the death of the ancestors. This news shocked everyone. They couldn't believe that the powerful ancestors were killed by the blood ancestor. Meanwhile, Palmer, who had obtained the nuclear bomb, returned to the Stoneheart group. News of his betrayal would soon reach the master, so he needed to be prepared in advance. Palmer asked all his bodyguards to hide in the room while he pretended to be weak and lay on the hospital bed. As expected, Eichhorst, upon receiving the information, quickly arrived and demanded Palmer hand over the nuclear bomb. However, Palmer refused, using the excuse that the master hadn't granted him immortality, which infuriated Eichhorst. Eichhorst stated that if it weren't for the master giving Palmer his white blood, he would already be dead, and he was now prepared to kill Palmer. Palmer remained composed and told Eichhorst that if he died, nobody would know the whereabouts of the nuclear bomb. Eichhorst proposed turning Palmer into a vampire first so that the master would know all his memories, and then he would break his neck. Just as Eichhorst was about to make a move, Palmer swiftly pulled out a gun hidden under the blanket. With a gunshot, Eichhorst was knocked back several meters. Immediately, Palmer prepared to pursue his advantage, and the hidden bodyguards also rushed out from the room. Palmer quickly went to the elevator entrance to check, but Eichhorst had already escaped. Injured Eichhorst was staggering down the street. He was on the verge of death now, and as he fell, he kept shouting for the master. After an unknown period of time, a couple searching for supplies on the street discovered him. They turned Eichhorst over and then saw his appearance. The man had never seen a vampire disguised as a human before, so he planned to keep Eichhorst's head as a trophy. However, just as the man was about to make his move, he was suddenly shot dead. The woman immediately shouted that they were humans, but she was shot on the spot. Then, two soldiers approached Eichhorst. It turned out they were Navy SEALs controlled by the master. They were here to rescue the critically injured Eichhorst. Zack was playing with feelers on the street. This was the first time Zack had been on the surface in a month. Zack stood on a car and pointed to the flag on the roof of the building. He asked feelers to take it down. Following the order, feelers immediately ran towards the building. Climbing up like Spider-Man, speed was one of Feeler's advantages. Just then, a car slowly approached and stopped in front of Zack. A man got out of the car and, seeing Zack alone on the street, began asking if he needed help. Zack didn't respond to the man. At this moment, Feeler's, who was about to retrieve the flag, witnessed the scene. The man, frightened by this creature, immediately drew his gun to shoot, to protect Feeler's from being killed. Zack gave the order to attack. Instantly. Feelers pounced on the man, driving the stinger into his neck. Zack was at a loss when he saw this. Meanwhile, Palmer arranged another meeting with Citrakian. He informed Citrakian about Eichhorst's plan to transport the nuclear bomb. 
Though he didn't know the purpose of the bomb, it surely held great importance to the master. Palmer explained that Eichhorst had just come to seize the bomb but was severely injured by him. To retrieve the bomb, the master himself would have to intervene, presenting the final opportunity to completely eliminate him. Palmer asked Satrakian to be prepared as he would return to the Stoneheart group to act as bait. Once the master appeared, they could kill him for good. Upon returning, Citrakian began assigning tasks to everyone. Dutch was to go to the security room and install the microwave sensor. Vasily's task was to bring in the coffin that sealed the master. The remaining individuals would lay in ambush at the rooftop apartment. And when the master appeared, Dutch would activate the machine immediately. When the master was immobilized, they would all work together to force him into the coffin. On the other side, Palmer returned to the Stoneheart group to act as bait. However, as they arrived at the underground parking lot, they were ambushed. Two vampire soldiers began firing wildly at them. The bodyguards immediately escorted Palmer to safety and then launched a counterattack against the vampire soldiers. Just as the two sides were locked in a fierce battle, the master unleashed a sonic disruption. The piercing sound incapacitated everyone, rendering them unable to fight. The bodyguards were instantly killed by the vampires, and as the last bodyguard fell, the master's sonic disruption ceased. In Palmer's surprised eyes, he discovered that the soldier was possessed by the master. Then, the master demanded the nuclear bomb from Palmer. Unfazed, Palmer told him that the bomb was in his safe, and only he knew the password. Palmer proposed cooperation once again, offering to hand over the bomb if the master granted him immortality. Surprisingly, the master didn't get angry but promptly agreed to Palmer's request. Subsequently, the master grabbed Palmer, and only then did Palmer start to panic. The master took out a handful of soil from his pocket and forcefully stuffed it into Palmer's mouth. The master intended to transfer his soul to Palmer's body and began transferring the worms. After it was over, they fell to the ground. After an unknown period of time, Palmer slowly crawled up from the ground. The master quickly adapted to his new body. Palmer and Citrakian discussed the plan to kill him, which was also known to the blood ancestor. He was going to unleash a furious retaliation against the vampire hunting team. On the other side, Kelly learned about Zack killing someone and rushed over. Zack was frightened and desperately explained that he did it to protect feelers. However, Kelly didn't blame him. She stated that Zack did the right thing. Being transformed into a vampire was a beautiful thing. And she informed Zack that the master already knew about it and admired his intelligence. Then she urged Zack to pack his things and go to the master. Meanwhile, Eichhorst was brought to the Stoneheart group and the soldiers placed him in Palmer's operating chair. Blood Ancestor looked at him with great distress. After all, Eichhorst was his most loyal servant, but now he has been severely injured by humans. Eichhorst didn't understand why the Blood Ancestor possessed an old man's body. Eichhorst has always been waiting for the Blood Ancestor to use his body, but the Blood Ancestor has chosen several bodies without choosing him. After hearing this, the Blood Ancestor told him that it was just a temporary measure. Now he knows the location of the nuclear bomb. And next, all humans will fall into hell. Eichhorst saw that his master's purpose was immediately achieved, so he immediately asked the Blood Ancestor to help him free himself. After hearing this, the Blood Ancestor did not want to give up Eichhorst. After all, he has always been by his side, so the Blood Ancestor was willing to sacrifice his own power to save him. Afterwards, the Blood Ancestor tore open Eichhorst's clothes and looked at his body full of bullet holes, feeling very distressed. Then he cut a wound on his finger and dropped white blood onto Eichhorst's wound. Then the wound began to heal quickly, and in just a few seconds, Eichhorst recovered. Kelly used makeup techniques to restore Eichhorst's appearance again. After it was over, Eichhorst led them to the nuclear bomb and showed them how to use it. He gave the controller to Kelly for safekeeping. Early the next morning, the vampire hunting team arrived at the Stoneheart group to ambush the blood ancestor. Not knowing that he already knew their plan, just as they were transporting the sealed coffin containing the blood ancestor, Quinlan suddenly sensed something was wrong. He asked everyone to go and complete their respective tasks first, while he went to survey the building. Soon, Dutch arrived at the security room to install microwave sensors. Vasily, on the other hand, hid the coffin on the ground floor. At this time, Citrakian and F have reached the top, and the blood ancestor disguised as Palmer is sitting on the office chair. Then F and Citrakian slowly approached obviously not realizing the blood ancestor's true identity. Citrakian saw his wife's heart on a display shelf. At this moment, he still couldn't let go and vowed to kill the blood ancestor. At this point, what the blood ancestor said made the two of them realize that something was wrong. Your son, though. What about my son? 
Fine boy. Great potential. You've never met my son. Zack has a dark heart. Don't you think? Quinlan came to the underground parking lot and found that it had been massacred by the Strigoi. He then discovered a body that had been replaced by the master, which made him feel uneasy. He was about to inform his teammates, but as soon as he arrived at the staircase, an ambush of vampire soldiers attacked him. The vampire soldiers were no match for Quinlan, who used sound to locate the enemy. Cetrakian saw through the master's identity and attacked him with a sword, but was knocked down by the master's blow. Dutch in the control room witnessed this scene and immediately contacted Vasily. Vasily, upon seeing this, instructed Dutch to quickly activate the microwave sensor. Unfortunately, the machine malfunctioned. Meanwhile, F and the others were still fighting the master on the rooftop, but soon they couldn't hold on any longer. F shouted to Dutch through the surveillance system, but she was busy trying to fix the machine. At this moment, Vasily arrived on the rooftop of the coffin, and the situation suddenly changed. Vasily launched the first attack but was thrown out by the master. Even with the three of them taking turns to attack, the master easily defended himself. However, the master was very annoyed and prepared to deal with Cetrakian first. Just as he spat out his stinger, Vasily wounded him with a single slash. Dutch finally fixed the machine and quickly pressed the switch. At this moment, the master prepared to attack Cetrakian again, but the next second, his stinger became limp. It seemed that the microwave sensor successfully suppressed the master. F approached and kicked him, then raised his silver sword ready to kill him. But unexpectedly, the master could still move and took the silver sword, slashing F. Vasily quickly came to support and directly drove the master away. However, just as he reached the elevator, a familiar figure walked out. Quinlan appeared in front of everyone. Waiting for this moment for a long time, Quinlan then grabbed the master and threw him into the coffin, the master still tried to resist, and everyone rushed forward to help. In this way, the master was successfully sealed in the coffin, Dutch also arrived on the rooftop and laughed happily upon hearing that the master had been sealed. At this moment, she noticed F's injury, Dutch quickly approached to check his condition, and Cetrakian said that the mission was not yet completed, they needed to sink the master into the sea. The group then began to act. And F, seeing that he was not seriously injured, asked Dutch to help with the microwave sensor. As a doctor, he could handle the wound himself. Seeing that F was fine, Dutch immediately followed the team to complete the next task. Eichhorst, who was performing a mission at this time, suddenly couldn't feel the presence of the blood ancestor. He immediately ordered his subordinates to return to the Stoneheart group. Meanwhile, Kelly also sensed that something was wrong with the master and quickly ran to the rooftop with Zack. F who was bandaging his wound, encountered Kelly at this moment. After seeing that Zack was fine, F was very happy. Zack? But in the next second, Kelly rushed towards F and they immediately started fighting. Because F was seriously injured, he was always suppressed by Kelly. Stop! Get off! But F still found the opportunity to push Kelly away. Immediately after, F stood up and fought with Kelly again. In this way, Zack witnessed his father kill Kelly. On the other side, Quinlan and the others had already arrived at the coast, and they quickly transported the coffin onto the yacht. At the same time, Zack was very angry when he saw his dead mother, so he took out the controller of the nuclear bomb. After seeing this, F quickly got up and grabbed the controller, but the next second, 